Okay. Is everyone alive? Yeah. Are you alive? Okay. Um, the trick is always to try to take the discussants comments to say what you didn't have time to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm triangulating here. But uh, thank you for thinking on the spot about what I decided to say at the last minute. That was very, very acrobatic um, and interesting. And uh, to talk about an archive, this gives me a chance to explain my project that I didn't show you, um, which is that there are archives of Samistad, and we know where they are. And some of my kind of day job is working with them and helping them to not just digitize, but uh, properly ontologize their is that good? properly ontologize their collections so that they can speak to each other, so that I can do my project. <laughs> That's my goal, <laughs> but it's also good for them. But what I'm trying to do is connect that physical archive, like okay, Brahman, Budapest, Karta, these places, um, with the archive that I see in LexisNexis. And so that's why I keep bringing up these Western texts and these Western circulation, English language, French language. I'm trying to make an archive out of what was published underground and what was officially Tamista, and then what echoed in the West, and also eventually in the East. But that's just as a start, and because of that, uh, RFERL, uh, Radio Free Europe, Greater Liberty, is really helpful for that because it's a like a very official archive and an extremely uh, hierarchical and very well organized because it was constantly analyzing itself. But my goal is to break out of its sanitary um, boxes and figure out where it went. And Michael's right here. An index on censorship is one of my leads. I'll just point that out. Okay. So I'm going to pass this down. Maybe I, I will. I will. Just, I want uh, because I also want to talk about the language. It's, uh, of course, uh, this question reminded me of the fact that uh, all of you, I'm sure, know that uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the uh, Moscow, Leningrad, and I'm sure in other cities, intelligentsia, uh, Ra Russian intelligentsia, read in Polish. Uh, I don't know if that's... Uh, <laughs> Only because in Poland, in Poland uh, everything was translated or being translated, and Kafka and uh, and Joyce and so on, so and Proust. So the, the, this is a fact mm -hmm. um, that uh, I don't know how relevant it is now. Every, everybody reads in English. Don't know how mm -hmm. you know, but anyhow, anyhow the Polish functions mm -hmm. as a time is that language. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just quickly respond to your comment about book covers because something that was fascinating in the Polish independent press was often book covers were done completely separately. It was considered a separate artist group within publishing. In fact, sometimes two books would be published on state printing houses covertly and the print workers were willing to moonlight for the publishing wouldn't do the covers because they were afraid covers were something that would be so obviously that they were publishing something they weren't supposed to. And I'm going to, I'll say quick to you about emotional response. There was a couple of great articles that started being published in the underground in the 1980s telling people to keep sharing their books. Mm. That while they are getting more and more of these kind of beautiful quality and we understand you want to keep them, these are supposed to be circulating. So please don't keep them in your libraries. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll mention about the archives, which is the best time I ever had at the archives so I will share this quickly. When I was working at the Carta Archive, which is this wonderful archive of independent publications, and one of the best things about it is that almost daily when I would be working there, people would come in and donate <coughs> books and things, and they would often just be stop and talk because like the, the these are fantastic. They have chocolates, they have a chat. And a gentleman came in one time uh, to donate a collection of papers, and the archivist said, "I'm sorry, I need you to hey, give me your name so that I can." <coughs> check it off and say, well, my name's Big Nev Boyak, but don't worry, lots of people don't recognize me, it's been what, it's helped me in the past, and it was just such a fantastic like, day at the archive for me, so I'll go share that for good times and Tommy's not archival research. I would like to add also, because this uh, image, uh, uh, this image of uh, this blossoming publishing system uh, left out a little bit of problems, for example, that there was no way of getting paper in Poland. So that it was all, uh, it was all somehow organized. 
that the majority of this publication was unreadable. <laughs> it was terrible. It was really terrible to have to be. So there was a constant fight over quality, uh, the quality versus quantity. Uh, and having been, I, I have been, uh, I, I've lived abroad and I was on, uh, on some lists people would send publications through mail. Or, but there was an arrest on the, on the last name, but not on the address. So I had, uh, you know, I was getting letters like to the Marilyn Monroe, you know, <laughs> and, my, and my address. And uh, gradually, this, I, then I was sending it, of course, I was sending it somewhere else. Uh, the, then the, it was impossible to reproduce at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really very hard. It, it, it was just sending it around as a kind of a piece to archive. But only then it became, and then by the end it was really beautiful. By then, I mean in 1980, uh, when, uh, when uh, the Tygodnik Mazowsze, the newspaper that was published by Solidarity, uh, was, uh, was printed in 80,000 copies in several uh, printing places. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, which you so beautifully described. <laughs> yes. As a former Soviet um, citizen, I can imagine how it was organized to get the paper, uh, in a way. So I can imagine that probably in Poland it was possible to smuggle the printing machines, which was absolutely impossible in Soviet conditions. But I wonder, probably I'm asking the question you already answered in the previous panel, how, how this all the circulation was organized, how you managed to, to sell the books, of course, not through the bookstores, but uh, but how it was because in in, in the Russian summers, does for many years it was simply circulated without buying. I remember I started buying such books where Xeroxes appeared, uh, but of course it was practically impossible to get there. But it was all kinds of combination how people working at this organization managed to to reprint it in the Xeroxes. Uh, in a way, uh, thanks to <clears throat> uh, not very good obedience to law in the Soviet conditions, in a way. But I wonder how it was practically done. Was it sold some way? In, in what institutions? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll play the first two, and I, I had thought I would be writing about literature, and then I started reading this, and this became the interesting part for me. But so it changed dramatically over time. In the 70s, it was mostly who you knew, but post-martial law, there were drop boxes created. There were people's homes that served as apartment, as mm -hmm. bookstores, until you knew that that was a person you could get things from. Uh -huh. um, the biggest publishing houses, again, by the late 80s, were publishing in several different locations. And so one of the advantages to that, when they discovered doing that, particularly with Tagotnik Mazocha, is the first <laughs> place that um, they started doing that, realizing that if you actually give printing places matrices, then you can create distribution networks stemming from, instead of one central locale, say eight different places in different parts of the country. Um, students were usually used. Um, people would take, if it was a book, 10% of sales was the payment for a distributor if you were higher up in distribution. People created fake um, walls in their uh, ceiling down. There were great stories from the 70s about when um, all of when it was much smaller and people knew each other that you would shout out when you saw the police coming and that would kind of be the warning, throw things out the window in bags and then try to collect it after. Um, and so there were, it, 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 was, it was fascinating, diverse um, distribution networks and bringing paper in was in the late 80s every single publishing editor of a major publishing, publishing house said that was the biggest problem, was getting the paper because you just needed such quantities of it that, this, that it was bought through bribery. Um, people got, would make fake stamps so that they could pretend they were, say, from an official student group, and that would be a way to be able to get some paper begging from friends that was kind of a diverse hodgepodge sort of. And she's not mentioning it. I'm just going to say, Another way to find out is to read Siobhan's book, Books Are Weapons. It was published last year, and all of this information is beautifully detailed about the business and the practice and material conditions. Just
Thank you for three wonderful papers. Um, I, I'm just going to address uh, Jesse's paper, and, and I want to say, first of all, how indebted I feel to the work of Jesse Lagov and Frederica Kankovac for opening up this topic, and I, and I would say really laying the groundwork for um, you know, a new stage of scholarship and analysis of Tommy's death, which I've been trying to get my head around, uh, and, and I'm glad that we're continuing the, the discussion and, and the work on this. I'm so excited to hear about what people are doing. Um, I really like your uh, phrase, an iterative practice for thinking about Tommy's death, because if in my mind, regular print culture has the tendency to suppress the, I would say, texture, and maybe even usually the Russian word faktura, of, um, of de facto iterations in production and distribution, then Tommy's Dot as a, a framework helps make those nodes very visible. And, and when, as we think about those, I think you very helpfully raised um, the angle of media studies as an absolutely indispensable one. Uh, for, for considering more systematically um, the, the role of, of diverse media in making that iterative chain happen. So thank you very much. Um, and my, my question is, because I also wanted to see more of the mapping, uh, are, you, are you doing more of that? Will we be seeing more of, of that in the future? Uh, uh, short answer is yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> but actually, um, maps only tell us, as you saw, the map would be kind of messy. Um, and so one of the modes of, uh, let's say, quantitative analysis I'm working with and visualization is, um, is network graphing because, you know, another kind of buzzword I use a lot in, is, as well as iterative practice or distributed networks. So it gets very messy very quickly when you have one node being distributed to many sources and then being repeated. Um, so I think in the case of classical Sami's dot and Tommy's dot, when it's a slow and steady, and what's the term they call craft DIY production, like that is one mode, and that doesn't need a network craft necessarily. <laughs> so I think that, 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 that lo-fi material approach is, is necessary to account for that practice. And I'm just trying to account for a different practice. So a network graphs are one of them. I could, um, I've been working with mapping for a long time. And because um, Professor Nathan's mentioned the earlier example, there, I even have some crude maps of the publishing networks outside of France in the 18th centuries, coming off of an article. Um, I think his last point I'll try to make, since I didn't have time to make it, is I was always stuck between whether I should try to land on the institutions, which is kind of how you did it, um, or land on the people as the nodes. Because obviously there's people, in, and you heard that in these both of these papers, there's people that seem to be the agents, and there's institutions that seem to be the agents. And do I talk about Gidrich or Kultur? Do I talk about uh, La Mateka, or do I talk about cross currents? And I even heard that in the conversations about the DIY as well. Um, I actually think Phil's project points the most closely, because he points to someone who's kind of playing with the idea of an institution. Um, so I don't know how to represent that graphically, but I will sh be happy to share my maps, even my crude maps of 18th century France. They're really crude, but they show something. They show Huguenot expulsions and where the where the where the actual printing houses are. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the maps and the, the digitization of all this data. Um, you're probably familiar with the Stanford Labs work on the, the Republic of Letters and showing the patterns of correspondence across various European countries. I always ask myself at the end of the day, after one is struck with just the sheer beauty of the visual representation, does it tell us something we didn't know? Okay. Um, the discovery. Phil, you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, I can answer. I, yeah, I have, we each have a version because we've been both asking each other this question. Um, what it points to for me are sometimes undiscovered agents. Uh, so that I'm, I'm not trying to frame the whole thing forensically, but since that's one mode of inquiry, I, I often do, here's a great example from the Cultura map mapping project I did, I found a great concentration of money coming to Cultura from uh, Venezuela. 
which I didn't expect. I thought it would be in other parts of South America, which are more well known. So that sent me on a chase to figure out what was happening. So there's a mode of discovery that comes from it. And then there's a kind of a pattern recognition that, that's also sometimes available, uh, seeing patterns that you wouldn't have expected. But in the past, I've used maps in, in particular, um, and relational maps that show uh, proportional differences, like car cartograms, to look for where there's a break in the system, something I don't expect, some error, some outlier that I want to go chase down. I'll save it for later. Okay. I wonder if I might use the chair's prerogative and ask um, Irina um, to expand a little bit on, how, on Joseph Brodsky. You begin by talking about Brodsky, first reading him in Savistat, and then towards the end you're talking about his role in Zeshitik Zeratsky. I wonder if you could flesh that out a little bit. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, Brodsky was some kind of an inspiration also uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Barbara Toronczyk to us as a, as a figure of an uh, indomitable uh, writer, poet, who is, um, uh, who is kind of going his own way. Because I think that, the, that uh, uh, Frida Victor Vigdorova, yes, was her uh, her, uh, the transcript of his trial was one of the first, uh, uh, one of the, not the, one of the very important uh, underground documents that influenced the, uh, this, the my generation and the dissident movement in Poland, uh, because it was a, um, it was even though as it turns out that this major parts of it were misrepresented, but anyhow. Uh, the, uh, uh, so he was in contact with Poles, and he was very much translated. Actually, he was, his poems were first published in Poland before they were published in the Soviet Union uh, because of his friends uh, Andrzej Drawicz and Viktor Woloszynski and, and so on. And Poland's uh, dissident movement and Future dissidents had very big fascination with the with Russian and intelligentsia and with the Russian um, resistance, so to say, intellectual and otherwise. And, uh, uh, and so he played an, an enormous role. Then once he found himself in the West, he became friends of many of uh, uh, us, so to say. For, and he was. Actually, Barbara Torinczyk consulted him before creating the Shetivitaratsky. And in the second, already in the second issue, as I said, he was in the editorial board. He gave his poetry to the first issue. He had a phenomenal translator, uh, uh, that is uh, Stanislav Baranczak, mm -hmm. who, was, um, who was a friend of his and who was a, just a phenomenal translator in a certain way, that is, he created the Polish uh, Brodsky, which is, uh, uh, which is different from <laughs> Russian Brodsky, <laughs> which is much, is much, uh, much, uh, more, uh, much less vulgar, so to say, much, uh, very smooth, very smooth and very, very lyrical. And, uh, and he is sung in Poland, and so on. You know, it's, uh, however, he, uh, uh, Brodsky didn't mind it, I think, he, um, if he saw it. So this is, uh, this is, the, this is the story. So um, thank you on that. Yasha's giving me signs that it's time to move to lunch, right, Yasha? <laughs> or not? Yasha, <laughs> explain the sign. <laughs> if you can uh, tolerate this uh, for 10 more minutes. Uh, I want to ask how would you, especially Jesse, your uh, Google Earth mind boggling uh, model, um, how, I'm not sure to what extent it's actually accurate or correct uh, or politically correct or uh, academically correct. How do we uh, reconcile this uh, picture or rep representation of the epicenter, the center of censorship, and its and and its periphery, right? And 
clearly uh, the further it is from the periphery, the, the more relaxed, apparently, supposedly, uh, the censorship gets. And this is something I've heard many times from Genslava speaking of Lithuania, which, again, is relative because then farther west there is Poland where, uh, compared to Lithuania, there is something that is much more liberal. And uh, But this is not to say that so this model, and on the other hand, <coughs> something uh, like Gertrude's Kultur, which is uh, a counter center, right? It, it's a publishing center in itself, mm -hmm. um, with, I assume, with its own uh, radius, right, of, uh, of operation. Uh, can we think of this in visual terms? Uh, using our digital projects and how to be represented in such a way that it would actually be adequate to what we can, to, to, to what we are saying verbally. Um, mm -hmm. But this isn't by, by any means to say that what I am trying to reconcile here has, is adequate to, to the actual literary the reality uh, in those days. Thanks. Uh, well, let me try to answer. I don't think it's going to be adequate, but yeah, the visual metaphor you use tells a lot about what the major point of what you're trying to get across is. So if you go with a heat map, say, where is the most censorship? I don't know, we find it in, um, in the center of the center of Moscow or something, and then it were to be grad more gradual in other places until you hit a... Um, at a certain point, I don't know, post-martial law in Poland. I mean, I could imagine a visual representation which would show that, but that doesn't trace the kind of phenomenon I'm talking about. So what I would see, easy answer would be a kind of a layer. This is very, when you're telling a story with maps, this is very typical that you first identify um, some phenomenon which can be represented with points, say, or with lines and trajectories, like uh, individual publications or individual people traveling. And then you might um, establish a pattern there and then show a layer like where you have evaluated some metric of censorship, let's say, and see how they intersect and see if there is an intersection. And again, to return to my last point, what I am looking for is, is something I don't expect. Now, I know that those lines aren't going to go straight to that point of censorship directly, but maybe they go to an unexpected place, like Israel. <laughs> um, so that's one way of... of I think... You were saying on the first hand, how do we account for one phenomenon, one, one circumstance which we see as a condition, which are maybe radiating spheres of censorship, and then the other thing would be tracing a practice or a working around or a circumvention or all these other words I use all the time to describe how people actually react to those kinds of conditions. Then you can add a, a layer that shows the weather at different times of year. You see what I mean? Like I'm not trying to make it just about the one phenomenon of censorship, or commercial pressures, since that's come up. Um, <coughs> yeah. So one can, yeah, one could add different layers. I don't really think of it in terms of censorship. I think of it in terms of distortion, and that every time these messages get broadcast, they again are repeated. They get more, more distorted, but differently distorted, and that's what I'm always trying to account for. Um, taking into account, for example, Radio for Europe and its distortions. Uh, and we can probably take it <coughs> further, and we haven't really articulated it, but I think it is, at least in the case of the Russian Pakistan, and especially of the early period, can't we talk of censorship of Pakistan? Yes. Which would yes. be somehow yes. colliding uh, with that. Please do. Uh, uh, absolutely. This is uh, uh, the censorship of Pakistan. Uh, the, this is a very, in, the, the very clear um, uh, issue with the Polish literature that I know better. Uh, I mean, I, I, that is the literature that is written abroad. In fact, it would be very interesting to see, I don't know that you can map it, but to see the difference between the literature produced here and produced PAM. And, uh, and uh, that is, if, if there are, what kind of, uh, what kind of censorship uh, internal censorship and uh, and also external in the form of uh, publishing or not and reviewing or not and, and, and rewarding in some way for the literature that is published abroad. 
And uh, definitely, in Polish case, the literature has a completely nas different national consciousness. It has different geography, different cities, in a way, function in it. And uh, the most important thing about uh, about cultura was that it is uh, it uh, recognized very early at the very beginning the po new Polish uh, borders, which meant it gave away, so to say. Uh, uh, Vilnius and uh, and uh, Lviv, uh, and that that was completely rejected by the majority of um, active uh, intelligentsia abroad, and uh, that created a complete different set of actors, uh, authors that were published, and uh, <coughs> so that uh, Miłosz was published here and was not published was published with Kultura but not published somewhere else. And so on and so on. So there are very many consequences of that. Of that. I don't know that we can map them, but I wish. Yeah. Well, there's there's <laughs> other there's other graphic representations like uh, versioning software where you could sh compare versions of a of a particular text in different places and, uh, that is used for translation. I've thought a lot about that, um, and it would be great, for example, with maybe some of these Tommy's dot editions to be able to see them as is done in critical textual scholarship online to see where they differ from the authorized editions. And maybe um, the key concept of reception theory, yeah. horizons, mm -hmm. which is essentially just the <coughs> yeah. concept of horizons of expectations. Mm -hmm. So there are the PC2 horizons, right? That we are talking about more. Yes, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one in Poland, there's another one coming from RFERL, there's another one coming from the Tamistad publications. But yeah. I don't know how to map those yet, but if anyone has an idea, please share it with me. Our horizons of expectations are rising to the sun. Okay. Yeah. Um, once again, um, please join me in thanking the panel for a great.